Emma Kirkby, welcome to the University of Huddersfield. We're very Thank pleased you. that you're able to be with us for this hip happening, our festival of historically informed performances. Hip, yes. Hip, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I'm just very grateful to you, not only for singing for us today with Jacob Herringman, but also for working with students. And I'd like to come back to that in a moment. But first mm. of all, you've got a huge repertory. You've, you've sung everything from hymns by the Abbess Hildegard of Bingen from the Middle Ages right through to contemporary music. But you keep coming back to Dowland. That's one of the things that you, you're very much associated with. Yeah. What is it about Dowland? He's home. He really is home. I mean, I first sang, had a go at singing Dowland songs when I was a student at university. I was so lucky all the way through my life because I've had contact with lutenists. And really, when you've got a lute, then Dowland just comes into his own. You can enjoy Dowland in other versions, but the lute is really what inspires me as a singer. Um, and Dowland was a absolute master player as well as a fantastic composer of, of songs for the lute so I've been singing Dowland songs for I wouldn't like to count the years but and since I was a student anyway and it is really subtle stuff at the same time it looks simple on the page you anyone can have a go at it and very young people can sing it and enjoy it but equally you can find layers and layers as you as you carry on and so when I come back because one of my obsessive interests actually all my career has been diction I find more and more and more interesting ways of singing it ways of turning the phrases of leaning on consonants bringing out certain vowels I mean it's it's a it's an endless it's a lifelong fascination and one of the things that people often associate with Dowland's music is the idea of melancholy it's all forlorn hope oh, yeah. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that still relevant to us in the 21st century how, how, how do you view that idea of melancholy as, as perhaps something good to be involved with well, I mean, you could obviously take any year at, in, in our current se century and find plenty to be sad about anyway, but also take the average um, contemporary pop song, they're melancholy too. I mean, people sing because they have something to moan about, it's a fact, mm -hmm. and people enjoy it. The sound of somebody beautifully moaning is, I mean, yes, there is music to dance to, to but if you want some, some music to, to relax to, very often it would be sad. So I, I think it's nothing so odd about it, really, except that they had, um, because they like to be a bit compendious about these things um, and, and really analyse and find um, structures in things. Um, Robert Burton wrote a book called The Ana Anatomy of Melancholy, mm. so, and he distinguished four types. And so they really they, they had made a science of it, but that was because they enjoyed it so much. And you're also singing music by contemporaries of Dowland. Yes. How does he compare with people around him, like John Daniel, the composer that you're singing tonight that is not so often heard? No, well, he published just one book, only 21 songs, and Dowland, as we know, published um, four mm. and, and three more pieces in another one, and one of his books was so popular it was reprinted uh, three, three times over a 15-year period. So he was immensely successful. Daniel was, uh, who knows, um, he was working in a... a country house just in Oxfordshire and that's the, the, his wonderful book comes from that period and he wrote some lovely solos but he was yes I, I think less interested in in traveling around the courts of Europe as far as one can see mm. but as a composer singers adore him lutenists adore him and gambits adore mm. him he yeah. writes I think the most successful gamba parts of all of them actually even better than I mean, if I dare say, even better than Dowland's yeah. bass parts for Gamba. Um, Daniel is just such an idiom idiomatic composer. But he's also fascinating how he sets words. And his brother was one of the finest poets of the age. And I like to see how he took some of his brother's poems and just um, messed them up a little bit to suit his mm. ends. He, he, he wasn't too reverential either. The cavalier. Yes, 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 yes. So I think he's endlessly interesting. And one of the things you're doing here at Huddersfield is working with some of our student singers who will be performing with you tonight. Mm. A great honour for them and privilege, I'm sure. Uh, what is it that you think young singers, these, these are singers in, in their early 20s probably, what is it that they n can learn from you about performing this sort of repertory that's perhaps different from the way they've been taught to sing other things? Well, I think I'm very exacting, actually. They, they you sing certainly a song are. We had a, <laughs> a very hard-working session yesterday. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm really, I home in on tiny, tiny details because they help. I mean, I say, sing it this way, go for that consonant, and they think I'm mad, but when they do it, actually, suddenly the thing comes into focus, suddenly the words are clear, and very often they also have enough breath to get to the end of the line. 
because these little diction things that fascinate me are also incredibly useful. They, they, are, they make you more effective. Um, they're, they're fuel economic as mm. well. <laughs> and they're, they, they, the way of, I think singers are taught quite rightly by their teachers to get a good solid free flow of air. That's what you need, of course you do. But when you have these intricate songs, if you don't look at the filter through which you send it, then you're gonna lose that air again. It, it just sort of disappears. But if you know exactly how to speak really, really well without running out of breath, um, then singing is very little different from that. And we don't really pay that much attention to how we speak. And it relates to, it relates to speech, doesn't it? Rather than the, yes. than, than the longer lines that you might expect in later music. Yes, it does. On the other hand, if you do these diction things, the long lines are more possible. That's what's mm. so interesting. So I do actually quite brazenly keep pushing this line when I'm coaching singers of later repertoire too. Mm. I, I'm homing on a particular syllable which I think that they haven't used enough or something. And when they try it, they say, oh, that's easier. It is very satisfying actually coaching people and say, just try this. And if, if in the end they feel that life's got easier, then I know it was worth doing. Mm. <laughs> and, and finally, you've, you've spent all your career really involved with the early music, what's known as the early music movement, horrible mm. word probably. <laughs> um, yeah. How do you think things have developed o over your career and where do you see things going now in terms of, of interest in music being performed on historically researched bases? Well, one of the ways I can see what's happening is that I've had a little post at the Guildhall in London for decades and I do six days a year. <laughs> I come mm. in twice a term go in at 10 and out at 5 and I listen to people singing and I throw a few ideas at them and then flee <laughs> and that is really fascinating for me. Um, I rely entirely on the proper teachers being there as, as I do everywhere, the, the people who are really doing the work week in week out and looking after the singers. I just come in and add a few ideas but what I do see is the change and the level of performance of what we used to call um, uh, early music singers, and we now say hip singers, <laughs> historically informed. I mean, to be honest, when it started, it tended, to people, it tended to be people whose brains were ahead of their bodies, if you like. They, they were thinking singers, but the, the, the vocal raw material wasn't necessarily mm. there. They were what we call musicians' voices. I like musicians' mm. voices, but they're not necessarily going to move um, huge audiences in large halls. Now they're coming along with fantastic raw material but also engaging their brains. Um, in terms of young women I would say that to some extent the um, girls choirs in cathedrals have helped a lot mm -hmm. in the UK. We have a lot more young women who can sight read as well as the men and that saves a lot of mm. trouble um, and it's still true. I mean I have young friends who go and sing in, in France with a very special and good director, Monteverdi Vespers, that kind of thing. And she frankly says, I use English singers because they save two days of rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> mm, it's <laughs> and such the, an important skill. The English yeah. ability to sight sing is, is very, very useful. Of course, it's not the whole story. Um, once you can read something, you don't then just go on to the next piece without, without digesting what you've just done. And when we started with the Consort of Music and we had a mix of singers, we had some who had this choral scholar experience who were fantastic mm. sight readers and didn't quite understand about rehearsing. <laughs> but in the end, you want both. And I'd say that when we started with that clutch of voices in the 70s, late 70s, um, there weren't very many other vocal ensembles. People weren't so interested. Mm. And now the most thrilling thing for me as a singer is the number of vocal ensembles we've now got everywhere, not just in Britain, but all over Europe as well. And of course, elsewhere. Australia's full of fantastic singers. Um, it, it's, it's lovely that young singers now, they have a go at everything and they don't regard this repertoire as just something to, um, to grow out of. So I think that's one of the things as a singer that pleases me the most. Mm. Emma Kirkby, thank you very much. Thank you. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.